G'day everyone and welcome to the Neptune Theatre. I'm David Kilderry and today we're going to look at the history of the drive-in theatre speaker. There were literally hundreds of different designs produced over the golden era of drive-in theatres. They're mostly forgotten today but there's a fascinating story about what was good and what was not so good about the drive-in theatre speaker. Sit back, relax and let's have a look at the history. The drive-in speaker was developed by RCA in 1946. Drive-in theatres had existed in Australia, in Queensland in the 1940s, New South Wales rural towns even in the 1920s, and in Western Australia in the early 1950s. But none of these drive-in theatres contained in-car speakers. The first true American-style drive-in theatre that was constructed in Australia was the Skyline in Burwood, a Melbourne suburb, in 1954. The construction was carried out along with the supervision of RCA technicians, who of course not only had the equipment but the expertise from American drive-ins. Here we can see all the speaker posts waiting to be installed at Skyline Burwood in late 1953. As construction progressed, you can see the speaker post sitting on the concrete without the junction box or the speakers attached yet. And there's the screen being constructed. All of Australia's very early drive-ins used the RCA speaker, which was widespread in the United States, manufactured locally to the American design. Here's the Skyline drive-in speakers with a model and the new 1956 Holden. Food was a big part of the drive-in theatre experience. Here's the Skyline Drive-In Theatre at Burwood and you can see a chef preparing steaks for a hungry crowd. They also had an indoor eating area at the Burwood Skyline Drive-In. This Skyline Steakhouse was constructed on a small lake just to the side of the drive-in theatre. Further around this outdoor eating area, you can see some seats there positioned so people could actually watch the screen. And also in this shot, you can see some speaker posts placed here and here that have had lights added to the top. They also had speakers. These were mostly used when the drive-in was at capacity and people needed to park on the side road and pull up a drive-in speaker to use in their car. This shot taken in the 1960s. Here's these same speakers pictured in 1983, just upon closure of the drive-in theatre. You can see some regular speaker posts with speakers mounted upon them here and here. But here's this same particular one with the light fitting on the top and some speakers for people to use at capacity times. Well, it's been over 40 years since those photos were taken and look what we've got here. That's right the very same speaker post. It's got its downlight fitted to the top and you can see the many different layers of paint. I love how you can see that it was painted red at one stage, white and then blue. You can see how this speaker post has been modified with the junction box having a hole cut in it so it can slip further down the post in order to mount the speakers. This is the very same post that we just saw in those photos. RCA speakers mounted just as they would have been. Some great history given this dates all the way back to 1954. These RCA speakers are, are quite unique actually in that they actually have the very rare concession air switch. That's the switch at the top and we're going to take a look at that a little later. Further down the speaker we have the volume control knob the rear of the speaker has the hanger and the back plate of the speaker. Very robust in construction. You could drive a car over one of these and mostly the speaker would survive. The classic RCA speaker, quite possibly one of the most popular speakers ever built in the world. By the 1960s at the Skyline Burwood, now known as Hoyts Burwood, the speakers had changed from RCA to an Australian brand called NTS. That stood for National Theatre Supply, and although the company was backed by the rival cinema and drive-in chain, Greater Union, 
Hoyt's purchased a lot of equipment from them, including the speakers. Here's a pair of NTS speakers hanging off an original RCA junction box. Let's take a closer look at the NTS speakers. Here they are hanging on the RCA junction box. On the speaker itself, we have both the volume control and the concession air switch down at the bottom of the speaker. When you flick this switch, it made a red light come on on the top of the junction box. You can see a couple here, one for left, one for right. When the concession air system fell out of popularity with the 1970s coming on, the RCA and of course the NTS speaker modified. And you can see here's an NTS speaker without the concession air switch. It only has a volume control. They made many different versions of the NTS speaker and in fact most drive-in speakers had several versions as they evolved over the years. Both always have a volume control, but this one has the concession air switch which activated the light on top of the junction box. That signalled an attendant to come over with a mobile food cart or drink cart to serve you right at your car during the movie. And here we have the concession airs loading up their drink and hot food carts before sunset. You can see they're already swamped by people before they can even get out on the ramps. So they would wander around with these carts during the movie looking for the red light on top of the junction box and to serve the customers in their cars direct to their car during the movie. As I mentioned previously, food was a big part of the drive-in theatre. Skyline Burwood had both indoor and semi-outdoor food areas in addition to the barbecue areas we looked at previously. Here's another part of the concession or snack bar. And of course they had the traditional indoor snack bar as well. Many great and wonderful foods, often new to Australia, were served in these snack bars. In fact, this snack bar was even complete with its own jukebox. Okay, let's have a closer look at the NTS drive-in speaker. This is similar to one we've just looked at, has both the volume control and the concession air switch. This one has the back taken off. We have the volume control here, which is known as a potentiometer or a pot and the back of the concession air switch here, just next to the cord. What you will notice, surrounding the speaker, is plastic. Very common in Australian drive-in speakers. Some were actually manufactured with the plastic, and others were added later by the projectionist. This was very important. Not only did it keep the speaker cone dry, which of course is made of paper, if the speaker was dropped off the post, but more importantly, it protected the speaker from ants and other insects that would crawl up into the speaker and could destroy a speaker in a matter of weeks. This not only happened in the rural areas of Australia, but also in the cities as well. So that's a hallmark of the Australian driving speaker, having them wrapped in plastic. My favourite story about Australian drive-in theatre speakers, and perhaps my favourite Australian drive-in speaker, is the Brady speaker. These were manufactured in Australia by Bill Brady, a former village drive-in projectionist. He thought he could build a better drive-in speaker. He started at the Village Croydon Drive-In Theatre in 1955 and worked at a number of village drive-in theatres. He manufactured these, designed these, and produced thousands of them tens of thousands of them. In fact, every village drive-in ultimately ended up with Brady drive-in speakers. They had a unique and attractive style, a very attractive volume control knob, and a number of other interesting features. If we look at the back of the speaker, it has a little indent here at the back, which made it very easy to grab off the speaker post and put on your car window. I don't know of another driving speaker that had that feature. You can also see the Brady name in on the back to give you some extra grip. Very clever. They were a tough speaker. They could mostly withstand being driven over by a car. But something synonymous with driving theatre speakers in the golden era was that clunk on the window that nearly every speaker made as you attached it to your car window. Well, Bill Brady had a solution for that. He added a bit of rubber to the back of the speaker. This one after five decades, has mostly disappeared. But if we have a look here, 
Here's a rubber stopper intact, still on the back of the speaker. So as you applied the speaker to your car window, it didn't make that clunk. Another very clever innovation with the Brady drive-in speaker was the cord or the lead. Here you can see the usual connections, but also was a piece of very rigid wire that was added. Now this was also assisting in anti-theft, but of course stopped the speakers from breaking off if they were tugged by a car that forgot to remove them from their window. The Brady speakers highly sought after, great design, attractive colours, and used in driving theatres all across Australia, and in fact in other parts of the world. They were used to equip driving theatres in Hawaii and through other parts of the world. The Brady driving speaker. Another drive-in pioneer was Roy Dennison. He was located in South Australia and developed a number of drive-in speakers. This one is known as the RD1. His first version, although we believe there was an even earlier version manufactured than this one. Quite robust, quite basic, quite heavy. But many of these speakers were built and distributed all around Australia. His second version was the RD2. This one is actually brand new in that it's never been installed at a drive-in. It's new old stock. You can see it's much thinner, much lighter, much more compact. And these speakers were still sold new in Australia right into the 1980s. Here's arguably one of the most popular drive-in theatre speakers. It's known as the Lightning Bolt and was manufactured by Thompson. Many thousands of these drive-in speakers were produced. Some beautiful hammer tone blue. This one is in quite good condition, quite sought after, but again, it takes its inspiration from American drive-in theatre speakers. As does this Westrex speaker. That's right, Westrex manufactured a drive-in theatre speaker. It looks very similar to a Bevelite speaker, but it has its volume control knob on the front. It's actually Bakelite. Very intricate design. A beautiful drive-in theatre speaker used by MGM in their metro theatres, their metro drive-in theatres, which were located in most Australian states. A large speaker, very heavily constructed. Again, many thousands of these manufactured. Here's an idea for a drive-in speaker by RCA. It's the RCA Impact Speaker. And what makes it different is that it's made of plastic. Volume knob at the top. This one is in quite good condition, given they were manufactured about 50 or 60 years ago, and it actually has its original plastic hanger still intact. Very rare for an RCA impact. The reason that's unusual is because they simply did not stand up to the harsh Australian environment. The sun just tore them to shreds. Here's an RCA impact in pretty poor condition. You can see the sun has worn it down and made it very brittle, and this one has literally disintegrated on the post. The speaker itself is falling apart, and it has a piece of metal attached to where the original hanger simply got too brittle and fell off. Again, used in many Australian drive-in theatres, but they didn't last for long. They didn't have a good survival rate. And if a car decided to make contact with an RCA impact, it was squashed into dust. Here's another interesting drive-in speaker. Many drive-in theatres around the world decided to build their own drive-in speakers. And in fact, if they only had one or two drive-ins, it wasn't a bad idea if they had the skills. The Wallace drive-in theatre chain, based in Adelaide in South Australia, made their own drive-in speaker as well. This one is made of tin, cut, moulded, and put into a very clever speaker. But the Wallace train actually had well over a dozen drive-in theatres. There were several versions of this speaker. They were unique in that they had their volume control underneath the bottom. They had flutes cut in and a unique thick wire hanger. They were painted this unique green and they were very robust under the harsh South Australian sun. An interesting and unique speaker. Hard to find these days outside of anywhere except South Australia and even there they're quite difficult to come across today. A beautiful little compact speaker. Here's a few other interesting speakers. Another one with a concessionaire switch and a volume switch below. Quite a large, very wide speaker. 
That looks like a hanger from an NTS speaker, joined to the back. Often parts would get mixed up at drive-in theatres because many times they use several different brands of speaker. Here's a real hybrid speaker. It has the back of one brand, looks like the front shell of another, volume control at the bottom, and it's actually had a tin plate that's been fluted or slit to let the volume come through as the original one looked like it broke. So many different designs, many different unique speakers, and many were changed over time. Particularly as the money run out in drive-in theatres, it was a matter of keeping the speakers out on the ramps at all costs. Like the speakers themselves, junction boxes, what the speakers actually hung on, came in many different shapes and sizes as well. Australia utilised a number of Australian brands, but also some American brands. This one is a large junction box, and you can see it's very early because it has the concessionaire's lights on the top. Here's a much more compact junction box, very common in Australia. One of my favourites is the UFO. You can see a very sleek, futuristic, almost space-style design. Again, very common in Australia. Here's another large junction box, again an early one because it has the concessionaire's lights on the top or what remains of them. Here's actually the insides of a Brady junction box. We have a small transformer to step down the voltage for the light and we have the various terminals and connections here for the speaker wiring. The reason they had lights is that the light would shine down through those little holes onto the speaker post itself. Here's a very tough junction box in one of its forms. This is the EPRED. It has a plastic base, but very tough, very common throughout Australia and the United States. But EPRED made one of my very favourite junction boxes, and it's special for this very reason. It's known as a glow top, and you can see it actually glowed in the dark. A very clever idea, and they looked very attractive at night, particularly when you were trying to find your way through a, a darkened drive-in theatre. Here's something not commonly found in Australian drive-ins. Can you guess what it is? Manufactured by Thermalator, it's not a speaker, it's a heater. These also hung on the speaker post. This one is the Compact 500. It has a handle, the on-off switch at the front, and hot air would blow at your feet. Something else found at drive-in theatres were the down lights. Simply mounted to a post or pole, they shone light down at the roadway so you could see your way around the drive-in theatre. Of course, many of the drive-in speakers today are very collectible. You can find them on eBay every single day and in other online websites. Many people completely restore their speakers. I like to keep mine in the condition that they were found or last used at the drive-in theatre. I remember the era of decline of drive-ins in the 70s and the 80s, and this is often the condition that I remember the speakers in, particularly by the mid-1980s. Some brands are highly sought after. Rare, locally made units, more expensive than the mass-produced units, but you might just want to collect speakers that take your particular fancy You won't find many drive-in theatres actually with drive-in speakers anymore. FM sound has taken over from the old drive-in speaker and unfortunately they began to be stolen in higher and higher amounts. Some drive-ins started painting their speakers specific colours, blues, greens, reds, to try and stop theft or at least so they could identify them when they showed up online. But to no avail, Drive-in speakers these days are mostly found in the hands of collectors rather than at your local drive-in. If you do have a drive-in with speakers, why not go along, enjoy the speaker, check them out, use them, because that's what they were meant to be used for. Perhaps one of my favourite collectibles of the era is Skyline Sam. Here's that little stick figure appearing here in the Skyline drive-in ad in the newspaper. He was associated with Skyline drive-ins, and during the early years, you can see him almost everywhere. Here he is standing behind the car hops as they're selling tickets at the Burwood drive-in entrance. Here's Skyline Sam again, 
under the giant Hoyt Skyline sign at Broad Meadows. And here's Skyline Sam in the barbecue area at Burwood. And that very Skyline Sam still survives today. By the late 1970s, radio sound systems had started appearing in drive-ins, and this certainly hastened the demise of the drive-in speaker, as some drive-ins withdrew all of their speakers, or at least most of them, to replace them with Cinefy radio sound. The speakers disappeared off the posts and were replaced by these leads with a suction cup. You attached that to the windscreen of your car and you clipped onto your radio antenna. That delivered the sound through your AM radio, but many cars, of course, did not have radios or their radio had been stolen or was not working. So drive-ins had for hire these Cinefy hire radios. You can see there's a volume control, there's a fine tuning control, even though the station was already locked in on the speaker, and they had an A and B channel. You can see it's missing the switch there. Here's one that's missing one of its volume controls, but it actually does have the channel AB switch. This was important because many drive-ins had two screens, so they needed two frequencies. Some drive-ins, even with one screen, still used the two frequencies as they had a backup system. So if you didn't have a radio, you could hire one of these, sit them on your lap in the car. They were run by batteries, but you can see with these units, they suffered a hard life, just like drive-in speakers often taped together, hard to find today, a great collectible if you can find one because it really is part of the history of the drive-in theatre speaker. Another aspect of drive-in speaker collectibles are the speaker base. That's the teardrop shaped piece of concrete where the pole used to mount and it would come up and support the speaker. Many drive-ins simply mounted their posts straight into the ground, but others sat them on these concrete bases. They were large and heavy and designed to keep the speaker pole upright. They came in many different shapes and sizes and were generally poured on site from a mould. Here's a few with a slightly different shape. And here's the underside of one so you can see where the speaker and downlight wiring came up through the ground, up through the concrete base, through the pole and into the speaker and junction box. A difficult collectible to move around but the perfect one to complete a pole, junction box and speaker set. Many drive-ins today don't have speakers at all. In fact they don't even have speaker posts. Many of them just have marked lines for the cars to park and the sound is delivered only with FM stereo. But at your local drive-in, whether it's open or closed, Next time you're there, have a look around, have a bit of, of an explore, and you never know what you might find. Look at this, EPRAD junction box, some Thompson lightning bolt speakers still on the original post here at the drive-in. We hope you've enjoyed this little look at the collecting and history of the drive-in theatre speaker.